Hello, Silva. 
Hello, Karen. <laughs> How are you? I will just get you your letter today. Just interrupted my workout so I can attend your class. Oh, thank you very much. We do appreciate it. I know you always have questions, so we are welcoming everyone's question. Um, and feel free to stop us as we go. And we'll give everybody a couple of minutes to, to join us. Happy belated birthday to Bill. Thank you, Silva. Yes. You're welcome. We had a nice, um, Bill loves carrot cake. So we had a nice big carrot cake for him yesterday. Nice. And a little champagne to go with that. And next week, the whole, everybody in the office here is going to, you know, try to get together for lunch mm -hmm. to celebrate. Because Bill's birthday lasts a whole month. That's right. Um, we have Ken's birthday coming up, don't we? Yes, that's true. That's tomorrow, 15, I think. Oh, t t is it tomorrow? 10th? 11th? 13th 11th? or 11th. I can't remember. Okay. One, either the 11th or 13th. So um, we'll have to reach out to him. Chris will know. Yeah. Any other Geminis on the call? <laughs> <laughs> When's your so, birthday, Silva? May 22nd. I'm the first day yeah. of Gemini. Oh, yeah. uh, yes. I don't know that stuff, but that's on the cusp, right? Is that what they call it? Hello, Alice. Millie is with us. Can I say that again? Oh. We lost Alice. I'm sorry. Someone's car is beeping. It is not mine. Is it mine? But it is outside my window, so. I think it's out this way in the diner. No, probably. No, it's over here. Paul, it's your car that is beeping. <laughs> you never quite know. Ah, there we go. Thank there you, Nancy go. Morgan. That would have gone on the entire time we were here. That's right. Somebody's <laughs> trying to steal my car. We're going to give it one more minute to get everybody on and connected. Okay. Alice, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Everything's good. Randy, I don't know if you're just listening or, but hi. <laughs> oh, she's muted. She's, uh, yes. Okay. Hi. So, yeah, everybody's muted. I'm not ignoring you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> we're just saying hi, like we would if you walked in the in the room. We're getting closer and closer to that. Oh, it'll be, it'll be nice to see everybody again. been way too long. Hello, Tanya. Elena, oh, there you are. I, I don't see your face, but I see your name. Well, you know what? We can go ahead and get started if we like. And um, if anybody joins us, we'll that's wonderful. And if you have any questions along the way as we're speaking, please just unmute yourself and feel free to ask because we'd like this to be more interactive. I think it's it's better for you um, and better for us when we you know know what's on your minds. And um, first off, we want to thank you all for joining us today for the art of mortgage lending. Um, we asked for questions and we did get a bunch of them, so we put some. Uh, some information together that we're going to start off with and let you know what the question was. We'll give you um, some responses and feel free to jump in anytime. The first question we had, and I think we got it a number of times, is um, what do I do if my appraisal comes in low? Um, it does happen. We are doing some appraisal rebuttals. We do reach out to you and the um, buyer 
first thing to make sure that the information about the subject property is correct. I mean, it all starts with that. If that information is correct, then we, at least we know what the basis is for the rest of the appraisal. And then we look at those comps and we ask for your feedback. Lenders are always looking for um, other comps that are, that are, that are better suited. And um, we ask that even if the, the prices are a little bit lower, a little bit higher, that we put a little narrative together, you and I together, so that we can explain to the appraisal management company, what is it about the, um, the comps that were used that weren't as good as these comps? So we do ask for your help because you do know the inventory way better than we ever will. But if the appraisal does end up being low, we do have a couple of ways to um, combat that. One, you can go back and renegotiate if that's an option for you. Or two, we can increase the down payment. So just remember that on all conventional loans up to $548,000, anywhere in Connecticut, you can um, put 3% down. And that conventional product is our, also our, um, we use that instead of FHA in many cases because there's no, no limit on the, on condos. And you know, with FHA condos have to be approved by FHA, um, condos don't have to be approved on the conventional side. You know, it, it, at least it's not a per complex approval. Overall, sure. yes, the condo has to meet the guidelines of financing. Paul, did you want to jump in? I'm just wondering, um, can you see my screen? Because I'm screen sharing. Yes, we can yeah. see your screen. Okay, good. All right, I was just wondering. Okay, um, we also have FHA, three and a half percent down. Great for um, those buyers with a smaller amount of reserves or no reserves, have higher debt ratios, not so great credit or not so perfect credit. That's the other reason we added that, um, that line to this screen so that you would not worry if your clients didn't have great credit, could they still qualify for more financing? And yes, they can. Um, our jumbo products go up to 10% down. I think that's up to 2 million. So we do have room on the conforming side and on the jumbo side. And I know a lot more um, high end, higher end homes are selling these days and we're doing a lot more of those loans. So you can put, if somebody was gonna put 20% down and now they need to put 10% down, those options are available. Um, everything I'm talking about today in this, in this particular instance about appraisals is for owner occupied primary residence. So if you have anybody who has a, a, um, an investment property, different set of guidelines, but we have the same options open to us depending upon how much they are putting down. Anyone else who needs money to bridge the gap can always um, take out money from their 401k if that helps or get a gift from mom, dad, cousin, sister, brother, you know, anyone who would like to help offset that. We do have a nice little tool that we use to, um, to, um, to show how values will appreciate over time if you are paying a little bit more for the house than it's been listed. And we'll show you that at the end if we have time after going through your questions or else we'll do that in a separate, separate um, class. Anybody have questions on options for lower appraisals? Okay, I, then I did a great I, job. I do. Oh, go ahead. Um, the, the money that they're borrowing, uh, is it through a gift letter as usual? And aren't there any restrictions there? I mean, I know it was hard in the past to borrow money from people. Well, you're not borrowing any money from, you're, you're getting a gift. So if you are getting money from mom and dad or from um, a family member, you it has to be gift funds. And yes, we have a gift letter that we um, will um, send to the, to the buyer so that they can complete that. And they will have to show that the money has been received and deposited so that um, none of the down payment can be borrowed. 
on any instance. And it has to be a blood relation with the person that is giving you the money? It could be a brother-in-law, a sister-in-law, a cousin. That's Depending on the program, it may even be wider yeah. than that. Um, yeah, depending upon the program, it's, it's correct. Um, most of the time, they look for it to be a blood relative or sister-in-law, brother-in-law, because they believe that those people will actually give a gift. Like a friend would probably want the money repaid back, and they don't want anyone's um, anyone to have a lien on the property that supersedes that of the lenders. They want The lender wants to know that they're going to be paid first. So that's why they... Um, they have that stipulation in many cases. But in some cases they don't. So please remember every situation is different and we will address every one of them individually once we are working with the buyer and, and this instance comes up or a situation. So uh, Karen's got uh, the low down payment covered. I'd like to cover uh, another area that um, uh, you'll find a lot of choice and a lot of help uh, to help you sell and more buyers buy and that is the jumbo lending. Uh, Karen mentioned it in the previous slide uh, where we do have jumbo with 10% down. And that, that's a, a, a tremendous um, um, capability. Uh, not all lenders do the jumbo market. We've been doing the jumbo market all the way through for the entire time that we've been in business because Fairfield County has a lot of jumbo borrowers and a lot of houses that are a higher in price. So if, as you see here, we can do 10% up to 2 million. And I, I want to point out that one of the keys here is that there's no mortgage insurance. So the payment can be relatively low compared. Uh, and, it, and it really offers to open up to a wider group of buyers. Um, obviously, getting together um, a couple hundred thousand for a 20% down payment is going to be difficult for a lot of borrowers. But when you say, well, you can do it with 10%, then uh, it definitely opens the door up to more borrowers. Uh, and having no mortgage insurance is terrific. We also, uh, as a company, we are constantly out looking for lenders that offer um, good guidelines, expanded guidelines, what that means is easier qualifying on the part of the borrower. Now, some of the big lenders, some of the large box uh, lenders, they're very conservative on how much debt and how much income a borrower needs to qualify. And their, their numbers are very tough. They're tough on the borrower to meet. We have lenders that have expanded those guidelines, um, which when you expand a guideline, more people qualify. When more people qualify, more people can buy. And sometimes it can mean the difference. If they've gotten turned down over at uh, Bank of This or Wells over there, um, it, it, it may be because those banks are too conservative on how much they're allowing the borrower to have in income and in debt to qualify for home. And so uh, one of our lenders may be a lot more generous in allowing them to qualify. Uh, Again, uh, the no mortgage insurance angle, I, I can't ex emphasize it enough. Uh, mortgage insurance on a million dollar loan, it could be several hundred dollars per month. It's a lot, it adds up. So a no mortgage insurance program is a, is a terrific uh, a benefit to the borrower. Also, take a look at that last bullet point. You know, we're one of the few lenders around now. In fact, I'm not sure if any other lenders are still offering this product, it's an interest only adjustable rate mortgage. Um, as of this morning, uh, it was 2.875 on a 7-1 arm. Um, and just to, just to give you an example of what that means, if a borrower was bar, uh, buying a house, let's say they're buying a house for a million two and they're putting down uh, 200,000 um, and they're taking uh, um, an adjustable rate interest only loan. That payment is $2,400 or less of, of interest. And it makes a huge difference in a borrower's uh, monthly cash flow when they stare at that payment versus, say, close to a $4,000 payment, which would be the principal plus interest. 
Now, obviously, we're not going to give this loan to somebody that can't afford the payment. These are um, these are underwritten with the idea that sooner or later they're going to be paying the full principal down the road. But on a seven one arm, that doesn't come for a full seven years. So, again, this is a, a, a great way to get in with a lower payment. It also opens the door up to to um, the type of borrower who, let's say, gets a large um, bonus or commission during the course of the year. Maybe they have a set salary that they would only qualify for, say, X amount of dollars if you just went off their salary, but they can pay down the mortgage at that time when the... Um, uh, when they when they get their bonus, etc. So, from a cash flow perspective, this is a really terrific program for a lot of buyers. Uh, expand the number of buyers that you can uh, uh, help um, sell, help put into houses. Can we just take one moment? Um, Alice, you had a question. Is there a minimum mortgage amount for this? Tell me what this is. Just so that I make sure that we address the question correctly. Well, I have clients who are working with another bank and they- have Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know, they came to me with this, with this other bank in tow and they're putting like 13% down on a purchase of up to 650. And they have to pay PMI. So that's why I'm asking, would they be able to get this type of a loan without having to put uh, pay PMI and put 10% down? They could. If they qualify for that, yes, they could. Sometimes, you know, we look at it both ways. In this, in this case here for the jumbo lending, they um, the some of the loans are particularly good if you don't pay the monthly mortgage insurance. There are other times when sometimes when paying the monthly mortgage insurance um, is a benefit. It depends on how much you're putting down and how quickly you're going to get down to that 80% loan to value. So if you're going to get there relatively quick, quickly, then maybe you want the lower rate and you pay the mortgage insurance monthly because that might work out better for you. So it, it might be a credit score issue. I don't know in your buyer's case, but we could look at it if, if they wanted to, you know, call us with a question. I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, Paul. I just saw Alice with a question. I want to make sure that everybody heard it. All right, good. All right, you got that question. That's great. All right, so our next category is um, this. Uh, we're going to bring Nancy in on this because this is one that we get this question all the time, and that is, how do we compete with that cash buyer? Now, you know, obviously cash is king and we all know that, but there are things that we can do to help make your buyer um, be as competitive as a cash buyer. And so Nancy, if you wanna go through our lender certified, fully approved um, program, Thanks, Paul. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's me, Nancy Morgan. How are you today? Um, so this is very helpful because I know talking with um, realtors about, you know, how do I compete? How do we compete? How do we get this deal over a cash buyer? My buyer doesn't have cash. So we do have several lenders who will do a full credit underwrite of a borrower with a TBD, which is to be decided property address. So, um, and this is great because you have someone who's looking lost out. I have a few that I'm gonna be sending as um, now because it's great. It's good for um, conventional jumbo government loans. So for instance, I have a VA, which People are afraid to take a VA approval. So if I have the borrower credit approved, and I'll explain that, um, really what we need to do is have an accepted offer and get the um, appraisal done. So here's the caveat. So when you guys, um, when a, someone buys a house and they get a mortgage, two things have to be approved. The borrower with their credit package, which includes income, assets, credit, and debt, that the underwriter has to approve. They have to see all of their assets 
And then the other piece that they get approved by is the property. And that is the appraisal. And so, um, and if it's a condo with the condo questionnaire to make sure it's Fannie Mae warrantable. So this does not include the property, which as we know, sometimes has been a little bit of an issue, but this is great because if you can provide to, um, with your offer, you can provide the pre-approval letter from the lender itself, not just us, the mortgage broker. So I think that that has been very helpful. And I said earlier, we have more than one lender that does it. So I think that's another benefit. We have several lenders that will do it because we don't know where the rate's going to be. You know, we don't know when they're going to find a property. So um, hopefully that is something that you can put in your arsenal or back pocket or. Yeah, no, that's great. Put Nancy. it in your coffee. That, um, that's great. The, the important part about this, as Nancy was mentioning, was, you know, when you're, when you're in a competitive situation, sometimes the terms that you're writing up of how soon you're willing to close can also be a determinant. So for instance, if uh, you have a buyer who's ready to go and they can close in say 30 days, they're not trying to sell their home or their, you know, their reload, they're all moved, they're all ready to move. Having this fully underwritten pre-approval that Nancy was just talking about, it also means that the lender is ready to pull the trigger. The only things that, the, that they're gonna condition for, in this case, is the normal title work from the attorney, an appraisal, of course, and the contract. Show us the information. What, how much are you buying it for? And when do you wanna close? Now, what you're able to say as the representative, as the realtor for the buyer is, well, my buyers can come to the close table in 30 days. They're ready to go. I have a pre-approval that says that they've done all the hard work on their income, asset, credit, and debt. Show me an appraisal that works, some title work that fits, and a contract that makes it, and we can close quickly. That is a competitive advantage. Instead of saying to the seller, uh, well, we need 60 days because we're, you know, we we don't have the mortgage done yet, and or we need a mortgage contingency of you know X amount of days. So again, this is another way that helps uh, you be competitive against other bids. And just remember too that on every loan that we work on for any buyer, we thoroughly go through their income savings credit and debt to make sure that they qualify. We never send anything out to a lender that isn't going to get approved. So we do all the hard work up front, whether the lender gives us a formal commitment as Nancy is um, offering here, or we go through it ourselves and then you put in a, today and then you put in an offer tomorrow. Um, we thoroughly vet every buyer who comes through who will allow us of course to collect all that paperwork so that we can make sure that the the um, letter that we're giving to you is strong, accurate, and that you can be confident about it. Yeah, so this is, uh, again, these are ways that we help more realtors sell and more buyers buy. Now, I'm, I'm gonna switch now. We're gonna talk about um, one of the hottest sectors of the market, and that is the uh, buying investment property. Um, and we have, uh, Bill, our investor property expert, and he's going to show you some of the ways that uh, we can absolutely help you crush this sector of the market. Ready, Bill? Sure. So first, of course, we want to stress that if you have the ideal buyer who has a, just a W-2 with a big number on it and lots of money to put down and perfect credit, we can do a Fannie Mae investment purchase. Rates are fantastic. Uh, single family in the low threes and multifamilies in the mid threes. So that's still there. It's, it's a great deal for them. And uh, a lot of people are going to take advantage of that. I have a few right now, but we have other people with other situations. And as always, we're there for them. Okay. Uh, the debt service coverage ratio that you have up on the screen here, what that means in a nutshell is if you have a buyer who has the proper FICO score, which I believe is 660 in some cases, the write down payment, which is 25%, they can qualify, they are qualified at that moment, as long as the total rental income that the appraiser 
expects from your property exceeds their new monthly payment. So you have a two family house, you're gonna get $2,800 of rental income from it. Principal and interest plus the taxes and insurance are gonna be 2,300. You're approved, okay? Your rent is greater than the mortgage payment. And that really comes down to that's all they're looking at. Uh, we literally do this for people who do not have any source of income. Uh, you get better deals if you own your own home, but we have one lender who will allow you to not even own a home. Okay. It's a total game changer because there's far more people out there than you might think who fit this category. We have people who are, have come out of a successful career and now they're trying something new. They don't have any income that Fannie Mae is going to recognize, but they're comfortable, successful people. And now they want to invest in real estate and they can do it with this program. No so, hassles, no job, nothing on the application that could stop them. Uh, so and Bill, yes. So Bill, is that, that, that's true? No income. You don't have to show any paperwork it, to the lender. Yeah. It's beyond no income. It's no, there's no source of income. There's absolutely nothing, no income required, no income listed. Uh, you don't have to put a number down and hope that, that that you might make that this year. You don't have to have a job. Absolutely nothing. Okay. And a lot of investors are interested in the last bullet item there. You can close these loans in an LLC. Okay, That's huge for them. They want them in an LLC. So that is yet another advantage of this program. Okay. So, so, yeah. so you're saying basically that if you're an investor – you pretty much can do just about anything as long as the rent exceeds the principal interest taxes and insurance. Correct. Blood insurance, condo fees, all whatever of might be in there. Yep. And this, right. is, this is for one to four units, including condos, as Karen's mentioning. Uh, works on one unit, works on four units, works on anything in between. So, for instance, if I'm a if I'm a landscaper and my and I'm I'm paid mostly in cash and I've got a good thriving business and I want to take some of those proceeds and buy a two family or a three family, let's say in Waterbury. But obviously, I can't bring my tax returns and, and W-2s and K. I can't bring all the paperwork to a lender. But yet this program will allow me to go do that. Not only that, but they're not even going to force you to put uh, what you let's say in that case, on some programs, it, they would require you to put what you actually receive in cash on the application, which nobody's comfortable doing. They're not even going to ask you to put your source of income. So yes, that will absolutely work. And that's 25% down? Correct. Ah, that's terrific. Okay. So obviously, this definitely will help more buyers buy. And uh, as realtors, you can definitely see, you can uh, help more uh, people buy more properties. So um, one, one more quick comment, Paul. Sure. That 25% down, if you're buying a two to four family with Fannie Mae, you still need 25% down, even if you have everything else to show them and it's perfect. So it's not even a higher down payment. So this program doesn't require any more down payment than the usual and customary investor programs. And yet it allows you a lot less paperwork. Correct. That's fabulous. Uh, are the rates, uh, you know, through the roof or are they similar? Their um, investor property rates are always higher. Um, I've sure. seen some quotes in the upper fours, which is pretty reasonable, I think. Yeah, that's great. All right. Super. To be able to get in with no paperwork, I'd say that's pretty good. Um, so that's for investor, the no income. What if you're an owner occupied and you want to do that? We have programs there? We have lots of programs for owner-occupied, no income, light doc, no ratio. That's all the mortgage ease uh, terminology. But just so that you know that um, the no income verifications or the light doc, you have to um, verify your assets. So you wanna verify your savings for the down payment, but you're not providing um, income information on the light doc, except for a self-prepared profit and loss. They want to know that the bottom line of your profit and loss statement, when you divide by 12, supports the debt that you currently have and will support the debt that you're taking on 
with the new purchase, but it is self-prepared. So um, we can, you can um, qualify using the light dock. The no ratio allows you not to put anything on the application. No income whatsoever. You don't need a, an accountant's um, letter or a P&L, nothing at all. Are the rates on these programs a little bit higher? Yes, they are. It's always a little bit riskier for lenders when you're not verifying anything. So when they take on more risk, you pay a little bit more, but it's a great way to get into a home if this is what you need to do, because maybe you are self-employed and your last two years of tax returns really don't reflect on paper what you are earning. You don't have to keep these products forever. So if you're paying a little bit higher rate for a year or two until you can show on your tax returns that your income is sufficient to cover it, that's a great way to be able to take advantage of still low rates today and still have the opportunity to buy that home that you've fallen in love with. So just because you cannot document income doesn't mean that you are not able to buy a home. So Karen, if you're, uh, if you had like, let's say not 2020, if you're a salon owner, and your 2020 receipts aren't uh, nearly what they were in previous years, but you want to buy uh, a new house, this is a great way to not have to come up with all that paperwork as long as you have the down payment, right? It is. And it also allows you to buy when you wouldn't be able to buy through a conventional loan because you would not be showing that income. But now that in, you use the case of a salon owner, you know, the salon owners are all open now everyone's going back and you know you are going to earn um, the money that is needed to make those payments. This is certainly not um, us promoting anyone to buy a, a home that they cannot afford. It's right, still responsible lending. You still have to put your 25% down um, or 20% down. I think in case of the bank statement program where they're only using deposits on bank statements to qualify um, the um, income. So they will look at the, the deposits on 12 to 24 months of bank statements, depending upon whether you own the company on your own or if you own it with a partner, they will either take 100% of the deposits or if you own it with a partner, 50% of the deposits. They have an expense ratio that they apply and then they um, use that um, number to qualify your um, payment or your mortgage. So that's, your you know, your ability to qualify for that mortgage or that loan so amount. That's, uh, obviously, that expands it to uh, to more borrowers. Bill, you you had somebody, didn't you? Somebody was uh, long term in in an industry and went out on their own. What was that story? Yeah, he's actually closing tomorrow. Uh, he he was an employee. He was an insurance life insurance agent uh, for a company, a major company, and he decided to go out on his own. He did that in December, but then he decided to buy a home. Now, why so, is that? Why is that hard? Because he's self employed now, and uh, even the uh, light doc that Karen mentioned requires one year of self employment. The no ratio doesn't require any. Again, no, you don't even list your source of income. And you don't have to verify anything. And so he had to choose that rate. It was a little higher than the light dock, but he's thrilled. As I said, he's closing tomorrow. Uh, they're in the they're buying a condo that they love in a in a market where it's difficult to uh, you know to win a bid. They got it. They're thrilled. And I would say that in about eighteen months, I'll be giving him a phone call and saying, "Hey, let's refinance uh, into a, a new you know conventional fix because you've had your business two years now." And there's no prepayment penalty on any of these for owner-occupied properties. That's a, I that's mean, a great it's example. a great way, really, to open up to the wonderful world of self-employed um, buyers in Fairfield County in particular. It's really difficult when they don't want to show a lot of income because they don't want to pay a lot of taxes, but you know that they earn the income to qualify for a mortgage. So it, it really opens up a whole group of buyers that, you know, for a while there, couldn't couldn't buy after the 
mortgage meltdown, but but now are able to do so. It's a it's a portion of the population that was underserved for a long time. So and now Bill, we're able to help. So Bill's example is definitely helping more buyers buy. That's a that's a classic uh, uh, way of showing that. Um, you know, we also have a group. And, you know, they, they need to buy also, and this is a group of people who are re returning to the purchase market. Um, who wants to tackle this one? Well, I, I had this recently, Paul, so I can handle it. Um, so we have, we have some very solid qualified people who have had any of those three things, a bankruptcy or foreclosure or short sale uh, in the last few years, and, and many times, beyond their control. Uh, a lot of times they've rebuilt their credit, but Fannie Mae and even FHA have hard stops on waiting periods. So for instance, a bankruptcy, uh, FHA is two years, Fannie Mae is three. A short sale for Fannie Mae is four years. If you have, I think it's, if you have 20% down, you have to put if only 10% down, it's seven years. These are all very harsh periods for people who really didn't do anything wrong. So we have a lender who's taking a very different approach. And uh, I have somebody that I'm talking about specifically, they had a short sale just over two years ago. Okay, um, FHA wants three years, Fannie Mae wants longer. Um, this lender with two years, not only will they do it, but they'll also combine it with their bank statement program. So I'm actually going to do basically a no doc, no income documentation, documentation, excuse me, loan for these people. Um, it's not just that they can get back into the market, but over two years, they can still take advantage of these other programs we've been speaking about. Now, going to a different angle here, if they had had their short sale just over a year ago, they can still loan with this lend with this lender but they do have to go full documentation. That's true of a bankruptcy as well and a foreclosure. So if you've had one year out of all three of those, you do have to do a full documentation, but they will still help you get back into the market. And a lot of people, uh, and these are owner occupied only also, by the way, but a lot of people uh, who had these things happen to them are very eager to get back in the market and probably have been turned away from other lenders and even some other realtors who just didn't have a way to handle them. That's and so a great point. it's a great thing. And th this is, I'm going to go one more for you on the short sale. If your person made their payments all the way up to the end of the short sale, there's no waiting period with this one lender. Okay. So they can close their short sale last week and go into a contract this week, as long as they never stopped making the payments on their home. So you're basically what you're describing then is, again, a way to bring more buyers into the market who uh, would be told no by the vast majority of lenders out there. Correct. And the people I'm working with, um, they make their payments on time. They want to buy a house in the $600,000 range. They have 25% down payment. And uh, at a clean credit history, but they have a short sale. It was beyond their control. So, you know, this, this is a group of people that we want to help. And we want to have help you to help them as well so that everybody can, can increase their business. Uh, that's super. Um, uh, you know, that really is the focus here. Uh, I, and, and I know how Bill operates. Um, you know, when a buyer comes to him, a lot of times they say, listen, Bill, I, I've been told four or five times no, uh, because uh, I don't have the proper uh, documentation or, or time frame. And, you know, the idea is that you got to dig into the scenario, figure out what you have, and then go look at your lender base and see whether or not you've got a lender that'll accept that borrower. And what Bill's describing is a lender that will accept it, where other lenders would say no this lender will allow it. And again, it's just another way of uh, more buyers buying and helping more realtors sell. I think um, that's and the, the, that, that I think is the fun of being a mortgage broker is that we are just not confined to the couple of, of mortgage products that one lender can provide. 
and not everybody can do everything. So it's nice to have 30 lenders that we can access when we need it. That's not to say that we don't do your basic conventional FHA, VA loans, you know, with people who have their income um, documented or their savings documented. I mean, that's all fine. Um, and we love serving those people and helping to make their home buying dreams come true. But there's so many instances that you don't even know about until you start talking with the clients or the, the buyers that they need these products. And it's nice to know that they're available to you. So don't ever tell anybody no. I guess that's our message, if you would all agree, that we don't want to tell anybody no. We, we want to give them the opportunity to, to buy the home of their dreams. And if we can make it work, great. And if they need to wait a little while, we'll lead them down that path and let them know what they need to do so that they can become you know, buyers in the future. All right, well, this is the good time to throw your hand up if you have a question. If there's something that uh, you'd love to know more about, we're all about answering. Um, I had a, um, if, if some, somebody doesn't, does anybody have a question? I was just gonna tell you a VA story. Um, all right, well, I'll tell my VA story then. Um, <laughs> We are doing loans for more and more vets lately. I mean, more than ever before. I think I've done more in the past six months than I have in my entire career. Um, but I did have a realtor who kept saying, you know, Karen, we're having a really hard time with VA. The perception is that VA is harder. VA is going to take longer. You know, VA allows for 100% financing up to $2 million, but buyers want to see that they have some down payment. So we came up with a plan to show, to have the buyer actually give a down payment at, um, you know, when they sign the binder and a contract signing for 10%, like, like any other buyer might do. And at closing, they're going to be refunded that 10% because they are going to get 100% financing. But if, it, if they had to get 90% financing because they, for some reason they didn't qualify and that's not the case here. We did have that open to us. So they, they still were able to present their offer with 10% down so that the buyer would think it would, I mean, the seller would think it was stronger, but we're still going forward with the hundred percent financing so that they don't have to use their savings for the purchase. So it's, it's a really, um, it was a win for both the seller who wanted to see some money down and the buyer who really didn't want to put any money down but wanted their offer accepted. So Karen, they get uh, they get that 10% back at close, their attorney it, had it in escrow? Yes, and they're gonna get it back at closing because they're gonna to come to the closing with you know the full purchase price amount, which is you know all that the seller is concerned with. And what uh, was and the uh, interest? Uh, what was the interest rate on that loan? The interest rate on that loan was 2.375. Because it's lower for vets. It is lower for vets. Right. I mean, there's there's no mortgage insurance for vets. There is nice low rates. I mean, the, the appraisals and the, you know, what they're looking for is really similar to any loan. You know, if you have structural damage, of course, any lender is going to comment about that. You know, if you have a big gaping hole in your roof, no lender wants to lend on that. So, um, and there wasn't anything like that in this case. I think their purchase price was a million six and they're still getting 100% financing. We love the vets. There's no question. My goodness, two and a three eighths percent. That, that's a keeper. Yeah, they'll have that forever. All right, and so, it ends up now that they are actually putting 10% down because they said, oh, you know what, they, they will have some equity in the house. Well, and that, but that's their choice. So. Can, right. I, can I ask a question, please? Sure. I actually have two. Uh, so uh, in one, in the last one of my properties, I saw buyers switching from conventional to FHA. Why would they do that if 
I would uh, guess the credit, but the credit should be lower for FHA. Like if you're pre-approved for conventional, why do you, what's the reason? I don't get it. They may have decided midway through that they wanted to put less down and FHA will allow that. They may have seen uh -huh. that also with the combination of the rate on the conventional with the mortgage insurance they had to pay, maybe that was more expensive than going the FHA route. Mm -hmm. Even though you have mortgage insurance and um, on the FHA, FHA rates are lower. Now, so maybe that, that combination. Was um, that your buyers? These are people that you were representing? No, I was representing the seller twice ah. and the buyer switched. Ooh. They were I, for conventional and switched first buyer and then it walked, he walked away. And second time, so I'm like, what was going on? I have a feeling I know what might be happening. And this does happen. This goes back to something that Nancy was talking about earlier. And I want to point this out. Nancy was talking about a lender certified, fully underwritten pre-approval. Now that means that that buyer who has that lender certified, fully underwritten pre-approval, that loan is ready to go. But it could be that the people you're talking about had a little piece of paper from an internet provider who said, oh yeah, you're approved, okay? Mm -hmm. And then as soon as they actually turn in their pay stubs, bank statements, and all mm -hmm. the real paperwork, then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I, we can't do this, Fannie or Freddie. This conventional lending won't allow it. And then they have to switch because FHA has uh, uh, easier underwriting or higher de debt to income ratios. And so that may be why they ended up switching. That's a question of having the right lender to begin with working on your loan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That might explain that. Oh, another question. Uh, I know for FHA, after closing, you have 60 days to move in to become owner occupant, right? Is it the same for conventional? Yeah, yes, I believe it's 30. 30. 30. I think it's between 60. 30 and 60 days. Yeah for most, but um, most of them want you want to know that you are moving in within 30 days. Mm -hmm. Just now I, I'm representing the seller and we have a tenant on property. So I'm gonna time the closing by the end of the lease, but still I need to have some time for the tenant to completely move out for cleaning. So I need to know how much time the sellers will have. That's why I'm asking. 60 days. 60 days for any type of mortgage. Mm -hmm. Perfect, yes, because you. when you when you buy the house and you say to the lender, it's going to be my owner occupant, I'm going to live there, you do sign an owner occupancy affidavit that says, I will move into it. Now look, you know, if if the tenant can't move out till the 64th day, the lender's not going to come knocking on the door to see if the moving truck is parked out front. They just want to know that you're that you're not actually really an investor who's buying mm -hmm. it. So that's mm -hmm. really why that rule is there. You sign an affidavit saying, yes, I promise I will be living there. They do check though. I have had, I got a call, uh, this couple, uh, they bought a condo, FHA. They were definitely moving into it, but they were getting married, going on their honeymoon and they had investigators looking to see. And I got a call saying that they can't get in touch with them. They're trying to, and they wanted to know if it, was an investment property. And as it turns out, they were in there, but they just, you know, because of their wedding and they're going away, they hadn't changed a uh, certain, um, they hadn't changed like their utilities and stuff really. So um, it does happen. They do have some mortgage police out there. Not many. Get, get those pictures up on the mantle as soon as you move in. And pay your mortgage on time. And pay your mortgage on time. Any other good questions? Thank you, Elena. I have one. Suppose a, a buyer wants to waive the inspections. If they're getting like an FHA mortgage or Fannie or one of these other low, low down payment mortgages, can they rightfully waive the inspections? Don't, doesn't um, when the appraiser come out, isn't he like an, uh, an inspector also? Well, that's a very good question. You know, uh, we get asked that all the time. But the real answer is that the inspection is for you, your buyer. It's to know whether or not the dishwasher works, whether or not there's a hole in the roof, whether or not the heat and the lights are working. 
the appraisal is completely different. That's does it, does the house match up against other homes in the neighborhood? So the lender really is they're not asking you for the inspection. They are not uh, they're not looking at it. It's not part of the mortgage process. So if you want to waive the inspection, let's say you're you know you're a contractor and you can tell whether or not it's uh, a good home. That's absolutely up to you. Waiving the appraisal, well, that's a whole nother kettle of fish, as we say. I think, Paul, what Alice is saying is that the appraiser is doing a de facto inspection. So, so to say you're waiving inspections wouldn't be accurate. But he hit on the right thing, Alice, which is that the appraisal is for the lender. So it goes towards the mortgage contingency, not the sales price or any negotiations. And at the end of the day, when the appraiser says, that the front railing has to be reattached or you cannot have this loan, that has nothing to do with inspections or negotiations. It's a, it's a hard stop. Somebody's going to fix the rail or the deal's not going to go through, but it's not the buyers trying to game the system. So it's a different, entirely different thing. Um, and I'll add that when you're doing a VA loan, you do need a termite inspection. It is required from all the lenders and or, or by the VA and the buyer cannot pay for that. So it has to be paid for by someone else um, but, and not by their relatives or anything like that. It would have to be paid for by the realtor or the seller. And then, you know, later um, you can do as you wish, but um, the, the buyer cannot pay or the bet cannot pay for the termite inspection. One Karen, thing I will tell if you this, if this is the part of the general inspection, how, yes. how to operate them. It, yep. That's to have a separate invoice. Yeah, or you can say no charge. The the inspector can say termite inspection, no charge. Okay, so that's okay. It's just for VA, right? I have never heard about yes. it. Just for VA. Thank you for that new information. And will you be able to share the slides? with every Absolutely. perfect thank you any other questions um, right. bill nancy um what is the water um is there a potability on fha or no? there's a there's a flow test and potability okay. usually so um your well if you have a well on a government loan you need to have it tested that it, there's sufficient flow and that the water's potable. So, and, uh, and Bill, can uh, do most inspectors uh, have the ability to write that up or is that a specialized test? Uh, if your inspector was doing the potability, they would be sending it to a lab, okay? So um, I think you can do it directly with the, the, you know, I think maybe the agents can do it directly where they send it to the lab. Uh, but it's done at a lab as far as potability. The flow, the inspector should be able to handle. Super. So it's nothing really extra that uh, creates a difficulty. Not Other really. The fact that you have to get the potability test. Right. And it's, but it's important as a buyer, if they tell you your water's, you know, really bad and, and dangerous, you'd want to know that. So it's, it's not a bad thing. Very good. I'll send these slides over on the intranet or over the intranet so everybody will get them emailed to them. So don't worry about that. All right, and I see we have some uh, emails in the chat box. So I'll make sure to write those down so you guys get them as well. I got that. Anyone else have a question? We like questions. Uh, hey, um, there's a question in the chat, actually, uh, from Dan <laughs> Carter. He's asking if there's any cheat sheets available showing differences in inspections from, you know, FHA, VA, and, and stuff like that. You know, I don't know if we have an actual sheet put together, but um, I'm wondering if, uh, if an inspector themselves might have... Uh, um, you know, your local inspector might have that. We can check into that. Or we can put something together that summarizes what we talked about today. 
and get it out to everybody. I'm sure if you're asking about it, everybody else in every agent at KW wants it too. All right. If there's nothing else, then I'm hoping you guys learn some new ways to uh, help your buyers buy. And um, we have been your mortgage partner at Westport Mortgage since 2007. And let us know if we can uh, help make uh, help make homeowners' dreams come true. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everybody. It was care. great. Nice to see you all. Thank you again. I got to leave. Bye, everybody. Thank you for everything. Bye. Great, great session. Thank you. We'll be doing another one next month. You are all perfect. I'll be there. And okay. hopefully, I'll be calling you guys for some business soon. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.